Okay, uh, I'm, I'm the rotating GM, Grandmaster Ben Feingold. Uh, I used to be the only Grandmaster in residence, but now I'm not. Uh, next week we'll have Yasser Sarawan back for about six weeks, give or take, uh, and I'll be here until Sunday. Super Bowl Sunday. As soon as the Super Bowl starts, I'm out. Okay. Um, well, before we start the lecture, even though it's already started, that was an interesting sentence. Um, Grandmaster died a few days ago, and God, none of you heard of him. Uh, well, you heard of him at home, and Ken West barely heard of him. His name was Giola Sachs. Uh, he was a Hungarian Grandmaster. He was a candidate for the World Championship. And he was a very strong player when I lived in Europe 25 years ago. He was one of the top 20 players in the world, possibly top 10 in the world. That's stretching it a little, but definitely top 20. So he was one of the top five or six players in Hungary for 30 years. And uh, well, he died last week. Um, yeah, it seems like every week when I lecture or don't lecture, a grandmaster dies. So I guess I'll be the best player in the world soon. <laughs> might, might take two or three years, but if I'm alive, I'm, I'm looking good. Um, and, and for the intermediate lecture, I'm going to make things a little easier than usual because normally when I ask questions, you know, there's these thought bubbles above your heads with like, you know, a donkey and flies around it. And, you know, like, a, and there's just, you know, there's like tabula rasas everywhere. You know what I'm saying, right, Matt? Yeah, he's like, man, that's, I took the words out of his mouth. Okay, so the first, so I want to show you some ladder games. It's interesting. I, I played one rated game on Friday. I played one Saturday. I played one Sunday. The chess club was closed on Monday, so I played six. No, and then I played zero. And then on Tuesday, which was yesterday, I played two rated games in the ladder tournament. Um, and I won them both, surprisingly. So I was black in the first game and in the second game. Okay, so I'm playing everybody's favorite uh, Grandmaster beater, and that's Preston Smith. And Preston beat Grandmaster last month, which is on our website, stlouischessclub.org, uh, in a simultaneous exhibition, a perfect game. <clears throat> and that was the Grandmaster residence, Josh Friedel, the only GM in residence who was a GM in residence le less than, than this tenure. This is a nine day tenure that I have now, and I think he was like four days. So well, after losing to Preston, no matter how bad the weather was and how many flights were canceled, he had to fly back to Milwaukee. Okay, so I'm black against Preston. Preston always plays E4. And I play different openings. I like to play the Carol Khan. Um, I've been talking about the Carol Khan lately with several people. And Preston played theory for at least three moves, which is almost a record. Okay, almost. Okay, we'll have to look into that. We'll have to, our stats department, analyze that. Okay, he played the advanced variation. Now, Preston likes to play F4 when he's Wyatt. And I'm from Michigan, and there's a player there named Jennifer Skidmore, who's a Class A player. And she also always plays F4 with Wyatt in every opening. She doesn't play it on move one, but she plays F4 eventually. So every move I'm waiting for F4. Like, okay, where's F4? It's already move three, come on. Okay, now as you know, this is called the advanced variation of the Carol Khan. And what is the main move that black can play in this position? Anyone, anyone? Uh, you. Bishop F5. Bishop F5. Now, if you know me, I don't like to play the main move because my opponent is more likely to know the main move than know a sideline. Now, this you may not know. Which move for black is the most common that is not Bishop F5? Ah, there's the horse of a different color. Uh, yes, Dorothy. C5 is correct. He didn't get the, the Wizard of Oz reference, but even so. You know, the horse of a different color. All right, Ken West, thank you. Okay, oh, now they get it, now that I explain it. Okay, good. So C5. Now, this looks like an advanced French, except my pawn is not on E6. Come on, work. Yes, it's green. Oh, now it's red. Cool. Okay, and then I like colors. So normally your pawn's on e6. Oh, that didn't work. And this is an advanced French. But I've played c6 and c5, so I'm down a tempo. But I haven't played e6 yet. So when I play bishop to f5, oh, let's do it in red. Okay. Then my bishop will be outside of the pawn chain. Usually that bishop has some issues. Now the way to punish c6 and c5 is to take on c5. So grandmasters would take on c5 here and white's a pawn ahead. Black eventually wins his pawn back, but white has sort of a good version of the advanced French, I think. 
Okay, but Preston probably didn't know the move C5. He played a move that I faced a lot, which is C3. And white's still playing like in the advanced French mode, except I'm going to have a nice bishop on F5. Okay, now this is a move a lot of players like you guys and you at home would play. Um, Preston plays it a lot against me in similar positions. And it's almost always a mistake. So hopefully Preston's not watching this. Okay, uh, very common mistake that I see a lot. In fact, the week before I beat uh, Preston in a ladder game uh, where he blundered a pawn on move five the same way, he plays bishop to b5. He likes playing bishop b5, but that's something that you should not like because with all of your pawns on dark squares, uh, your dark square bishop is sort of locked behind them, but your white square bishop is pretty awesome. And, and it's considered your good bishop, so you don't want to trade it for my knight, although he always does that. So this opening seems to work out for me. And when I play the French defense, he plays the advance, and we do the same thing. And then I have the white square bishop, and he doesn't. So bishop b5 is a strategical error. You, you want your bishop on d3 if possible. Okay? And then you, know, you can sacrifice on h7 and mate your opponent likely. Not too likely. Depends who you're playing. But uh, bishop goes on e2 or d3 in, in this kind of position, not on b5 where it can be traded. Now, I had fond memories many years ago. I won this bishop. So I played bishop f5. And what ended up happening was, in this other game from, from years ago, although I'm, this actually didn't happen and I'm making it up, but OK, we're just, making, we're just inventing moves now. Now, in a position like this, I was playing a player rated 1,500 plus tax. Now, he wasn't as good as the Missouri 1,500 player because tax is less in Michigan. So you guys got like 9 or 10% or some fraction I can't understand. And in Michigan, it's just 6. And when I was a kid, tax was 4% in Michigan. So the players were even weaker. Okay. Well, I played bishop takes b1. Now, who can raise their hand as I get my hot chocolate and tell me the right move for white? What's the right move here for white? Ken West, that's not raising your hand. That's not raising your hand. Well, let's call on a random student, um, Ken West. What should white play? Also, wait a minute, you were sitting in the back. Well, what happened? You got her early to sit in the back. <laughs> Ken's like, I can't see, it's too far. Uh, queen to a4. Queen a4, that's actually very interesting. Hmm. Hmm, <laughs> queen a4. Queen a4 is much better than what my opponent did, so I'm glad I wasn't playing you. <laughs> that queen a4 might be the right answer. Okay. Well, White, white should play bishop takes knight on c6 and then take the bishop on b1. Possibly, uh, uh, Ken West's move is even better. Possibly. I don't want to say probably because, you know, by the theory, you know, by Occam's razor and Bayes' theorem, it can't be right. So, anyway, uh, rook takes b1 was played by my opponent. Very suspicious. Okay, and that's the move I expected him to play. And then I want a free bishop. If you're taking notes, winning a free bishop is good. Okay, anyone? Any, who can win? Who can, ben, do you know? Are you, you're just a pretty face, you just work here? Reference? What? No, do you know their answer? Oh. <laughs> He's like, chess, I, I'm just standing here. Oh, Leave me alone. I the I was like, no, no. Malvina, what do you do? You can do it. How does, how does black win a piece? Probably this piece, since it's hanging. Correct, check. Bishop b4, check. No. No, just kidding. Correct. Queen a5, check is what I played. Or, well, I didn't do that. Okay. I, I, I had a little, little, little too much today. So. Okay. And then it was mate because the king can't go to f1 because of the other arrow. Oh, man, that was an awesome move. Hold on. Let me, let me protect that square further. Okay. Right. And then, oh, man, look how the king is trapped. Terrible. OK, so then my opponent actually resigned, I believe. OK, so I was hoping to do something like this with Preston. But Preston played bishop takes c6 check. And I played the best move, because I'm the grandmaster in residence. So I played b takes c6. And we developed our pieces. OK, and Preston played bishop e3. And we need to pause here, because whenever somebody moves a bishop, I have to give a chess lesson. And I've said the same thing many times. 
Someday somebody will listen. No, I'm just kidding. Nobody will ever listen. <laughs> when you move your bishop, you're undefending the pawn on the second rank that your bishop was protecting. Okay, I don't have a pawn on b7, so I can move my bishop. Okay, even though it happened later. Shh. Okay, so the pawn on b2 is now unprotected. Also the pawn on g2. But that's hard to attack. Bishop h3 is risky. Only Shirov can play such moves. Anyone? Anybody get that even? And I, and I oh, terrible. Okay, uh, one of the greatest bishop endings of all time was a game Shirov where he played bishop h3 and it was hanging. And then he wins by one tempo. Because, well. All right, but look, look the game up, you'll like it. Okay, so I want to attack b2 because his bishop isn't defending b2. And it's not an open line, so it makes sense I should want to attack it. On the other hand, my pawn on c5 is attacked. And it's in green, so that's got to be careful. Okay, so what move can I make to defend my c5 pawn and attack his b2 pawn? Two for one. Who can do it? Probably can. Attack that b2 pawn and defend the c5 pawn. All in one move. Or double your money back for this lecture. Queen to b6. Okay, now he didn't want me to play queen takes b2 because then I'd probably win. So he played queen to d2. And now I realized that his queen on d2 was blocking all of his pieces. Neither knight can go to d2, and his bishop can't go to d2. And more importantly, his king can't go to d2. No, that's not that important. Okay, and because of that, I can play a typical Karo Khan move that you normally don't see in the French, but this turn is a Karo Khan, so it's still a Karo Khan. And what you want to do in the French advance when this bishop is on c8 is you very often play knight g7, knight f5. The reason you do that is knight f6 is too risky. Play knight f6, you can get in trouble. But you can play knight e7 to f5. Okay, when you play bishop f5 in the Karo Khan, it's hard to play knight f5 because your bishop's there. So I played typical Karo Khan move, which I first saw in a game played, oh, around 1990, between Nigel Short and Yasser Sarawan. Yasser will be here next week. We can ask him if I got the year right. And Yasser played bishop to e4. His knight was already on e7. He wanted to play knight to f5. And now bishop e4 is extra strong because I don't know what he's going to do about his knight there. I'm going to take it and ruin his pawn structure. And if he moves, I'm going to take on g2. And knight h4 like smells because I think it's ammonia or ammonium you know, h4. Yeah, I don't know. It's one of them. Okay. However, the highest rated chemist in the world is anyone? Anyone? No, you guys don't know. He, he, he's a professor at Dartmouth named David Glick. I hope you're watching this. He's 2400 player, quit chess, and became a chemistry professor. So I should actually email him and say, is it NH4, NH3? Okay. So well, White's position, he's in a lot of trouble here because I'm going to mess up his pawns. Now, he didn't want to mess up just one set of pawns, but you can mess up two. If you saw the terrible movie Contact, you'll get that joke. And you, no, nobody saw that movie. So, no, you saw it? Yeah, he's, why, why build one when you could build two? That, that made a lot of sense. Okay, also, Matthew McConaughey in the movie made a lot of sense. All right, anyway, he played knight a3, very suspicious. Okay, well, that was the only legal knight move. You've got to give him that. And he didn't want to castle because I'm going to take on f3. So he's sort of stuck. Um, yeah, maybe he should have played queen to e2. Hmm. Anyway, I started to take things because that seems like a good idea. Grandmaster Ken West, you have three pieces that can take on d4. It's true. Which one would you capture with? Reverse psychology over here? Anyone at home have an answer? You're shaking your head at home? What's that? With a pawn. Okay, now taking with a pawn is risky. Yeah, it's risky because bishop b4 gives black a slight advantage. Yeah, that's why it's risky. Okay, now we know why the GM is in quotes. Okay, so my opponent didn't like that, although I would have, you know, it's, you know, there's some percent he's going to play it. Okay, but he played bishop takes d4. Attacking my queen, but I saw it. So I played c5. He played the only move. Remember, I wanted to play knight to f5. So we got to start with knight to e7. OK. Now, one of the reasons you guys aren't very good at chess is you don't know how to chill. 
right? Even now, like, Julian's twirling a pawn. He's shaking in his chair, right? He has to go to the bathroom, but he's like, I'll miss the lecture. So he's all confused, OK? And the, the higher rated players, like Ronan Harsvi, he, he's so chill, he's not even here. Like, he's like, ah, he's relaxing at home, you know. OK, so you got to be calm and slowly improve your position. That's not Preston's MO. Most low rated players don't calmly improve their position. They lash out violently, Mike Cummer style. OK, so what's the most violently lashing out move that White can play? And that's what he played. B4. Now, the problem is uh, you won't see White's position in pawn structure chess because he has seven weak pawns. <laughs> and the only reason he doesn't have eight weak pawns is because he only has seven pawns. Even the pawn off the board was like shaking a bit. It's like, oh my, you know, like you know, jumping off the table trying to escape. OK, so my C pawn is attacked, and I wanted to play knight f5. So that was sort of nice. My bishop protects. Now, this pawn structure isn't bad enough, so let's make it worse. OK, and that's, that's about as bad a pawn structure as you can have, I think. I don't think there's a worse pawn structure possible. Um, although my next game may prove that wrong, which was played the same day. So hard to understand, actually. Now, my pawn structure is pretty good. I got five pawns, one pawn island. White has nine pawn islands. Hard to understand that. Possibly I'm wrong. Possibly. OK, and he played knight to c2 since his knights attacked, and I castled. Now I was expecting knight to d4, and then if I take his knight, he can straighten out all of his pawns. If I don't take his knight, he might take my knight and ruin my pawns. So I was thinking, hmm, what do I do against knight d4? But Preston moves pretty quickly, and we're playing game in 30, so we don't have a lot of time to think. And he played knight e3. And the knight on e3 does not defend the f3 pawn, which the knight on d4 does, so I attacked it. Who would like to suggest, we won't pick on Ken this time, I'll pick on whoever answers. Who would like to suggest a way for white to stop knight takes f3 check? Yes, sir. King e2 was played. I actually don't see another good way of doing it. If you, if you move your queen you know, to defend the pawn, you're sort of leaving this pawn hanging, and then your rooks, and then it's all hanging, your e5 pawn. So I don't really see a good way to. And this is why doubled pawns and isolated pawns are bad, because other pawns can't protect them. And if you look at my pawn chain here, everybody can be protected. And even the pawns that aren't protected by other pawns, they could be. I could play h6, and this protects this. Or I could play g6, and two pawns protect it. So even if my pawns aren't protected by other pawns, it's possible they'll be protected. Here, white just loses all of his pawns. It's the worst pawn structure ever until the next game. So you lasted one game. OK, now you have many great suggestions. Yes? Well, I could, but I wouldn't call that a threat. I would call that taking a winning advantage and giving myself an advantage. Because if I play queen takes knight, it totally straightens out his pawn structure, and I win a pawn, right? Yeah, and then it's an end game, and I got to win a pawn up somehow. Probably I'd lose. No, I'd probably win. OK, so Julian has a crazy idea, because you know his, he's not 2300 yet. He said after knight d4, I should still play this. White will make a nothing move so that the variation works. And then I sacrifice my queen. And then I win back my queen. And black's a pawn up and should win. I somewhat agree. But I think this is better for white than the actual, than not doing that. Because now he has fewer weak pawns because I took them. Okay? And you know, he's a pawn down, but it's hard for me to win. Probably should win. So that's a tricky way of getting rid of his weak pawns and winning a pawn. Uh, I don't know what I would have done, but it would have been something I could have lectured about. <laughs> but we'll have to wait till next time. Okay, but knight d4 clearly a superior move because now there's nothing you can do. Look at all those arrows and colors. <laughs> what could you do? Okay, so you play king e2 as suggested by Julian. Notice how his king is defending his f pawn. Did you notice that? And there's something you learned earlier in your life called removing the defender. So what's defending his f pawn is king. So I played. Removing the defender. How did I remove that king? I just picked it up. No, I didn't do that. Queen to b3. 
queen to b5. Now, well, if he moves his king, I remove the defender. You can't argue with that. And if he blocks with his queen, which he did not do, I take his queen, he takes back, I take this, and now he's got to defend e5. Good luck. <laughs> and he's down a pawn, and somehow he has five isolated pawns, although not really, but it seems like he has five isolated pawns. Five isolated pawns, wait till next game. Okay, no, not kidding. Okay, and I think knight g4 just loses to h5, I think. Okay, so horrible. So he didn't play queen d3, he played. Well, king, I, king f1, then knight takes pawn check attacking his queen. No, king f1 was suggested by Matt and Justin because they don't make legal moves too often. Okay, nah, they made mostly legal moves, I'm just kidding. Okay, so he played c4, and I took, and now c3 check would win more material. Queen takes e5 wins material, so he played queen c3. And again, I want to attack the f3 pawn, so I played queen c6 attacking the f3 pawn. Okay, and I have two guys attacking it. This one and this, oh, I guess this is actually a girl. I have one guy attacking it. Okay, now, if you want to defend your pawn, you have to move your knight, then your queen defends sideways. You could play knight takes c4, which is very dangerous, because I could pin your knight with rook c8, but probably I would just take anyway. Then this looks like white's not having a lot of fun. White's down a pawn, and his king is a bit iffy. His rooks are pretty active. No, not really. So, although that's better than what happened. So, okay, so knight takes c4 is probably the right move. But he played knight to g4, and now black wins in one move. Somehow the game continued, but I win in one move now. I'm attacking f3, he defended f3, but now I have a move that really crushes him. H5, so you're in the wrong class. Now, the knight does not have a plethora of squares. You say that often, don't you? Yeah. So the knight can go to h6 or f6. He did go to one of those squares. Or he could not move, and I would take a knight, which is good. Or he'd go back to e3, and then I would take on f3, and it would be horrible for him, not for me. It'd be great for me. So after h5, things aren't looking very good. Um... So if two grandmasters were playing, white would resign because if you make any move, it's going to be really bad. Like, you know, pawn down, okay, but now, now it's like seriously bad. And, well, whenever my opponent moves their pieces near me and I can attack them, I see if they have retreat squares or he can save their, but he can't. So h5 is sort of a strange move because I've castled, but I'm threatening a piece that has nowhere to go. One of the mistakes you guys make a lot, especially Julian, is you attack pieces and they can move to like 10 different squares. And I'm like, why'd you do that? And you're like, well, I attacked this piece. And I'm like, well, he moved it away. How'd that help? Now here it helps because he can't move it away. So that's even better. If you can attack a piece that can't move away, then you're gonna capture it. So knight e3, which he did not play, would allow queen takes f3 check or knight takes f3. And then I don't know who wants to play white here, but it's not me. I refuse to make a move for white, even if you suggest it. Probably like you'd suggest a good move because the illegal move is looking good now. So, you know, queen takes c4. Queen takes c4, attacks the knight and the queen. King takes f3. King takes f3, yeah. even better. Now there's the king of illegal moves. <laughs> so, okay, my opponent played the aggressive knight f6 check, which I took. And then he checked me again. Man, two checks in a row. Okay, and I went back, and he took this. Now, some of you may have noticed my rooks aren't very active, but you were sort of quiet about it. Thank you. Okay, so I played rook to d8, and now he made a threat, which isn't very nice, because I am up a piece. So, you know, you shouldn't make any threats. Queen c2. Somebody raise their hand and tell me what white is threatening. White just played queen c2. That's a hint. See white's last move, queen c2. Yeah, so what's white threatening? Yes. You know the answer, I can tell. Yeah, rook, takes G6. rook takes G6 with a monster attack. Okay, although it's not working. Yeah, there we go. Okay, and then if his queen goes to G6, I could get in trouble. I don't want his queen to go to G6. Now, yesterday, somebody we won't name, they said checkmate, but it wasn't checkmate. 
because their opponent could block the check. And this blocking thing seems to be an issue with a lot of you. You, you guys know how to move out of check, not how to block. If your opponent's threatening something, you can protect it. You could ignore it because you don't see it. Also, that would be tomorrow's class at 7. Or you could block. How do I block the queen from going to g6? Grandmaster. Yeah, block the queen from going to the g6 square. How do I do that? How does black do that? Very grandmaster-like in presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Rook to d3. Now I'm threatening queen f3, which gives me the advantage, and I'm stopping him from going to g6. Now, in this position, my opponent did not notice f3 was attacked, and he was going to play rook to g5, and when his rook was on g5 with his hand over it, he was like, hmm, so f3 was hanging. Put the rook back on g1 and wondered, where can I move this rook to defend my f3 pawn? Okay. Most grandmasters would think differently. They would think, I'm resigning now, but OK. <laughs> OK, so he played rook to g3, which makes a lot of sense, and was very upset when I made the right move. He was like, ah, like he, he knew I would find that, but he's like, ah, if I'd only played another move, then he'd have a chance. Yeah. So what is the move that's really crushing here? Extra crushing plus tax. It's very similar to h5, very similar. It's, it sort of looks like h5. Yeah, and no, I'm not kidding. Serious. Uh, you. H4. H4. Now, your rook's doing double duty here. It's pinning my knight, but it's defending f3, and that's the only square it can do it from. So if your rook goes vertically, I will take on f3. If your rook goes horizontal, ergo h3, then knight f4 check is good for black, because my knight's not pinned anymore, and I take his rook. So he didn't like when I played h4. So he played the best move, I think. Rook takes g6, and I recaptured. Uh, now I'm up a rook, so I'm looking good. And I never noticed until right now he has triple pawns. <sighs> okay, so even still has a bad pawn structure. Rook g1, queen f3, king e1. Now, I tried to play the computer move here. Most humans would defend g6, and then the game would be over. Like, you know, king f7. Okay? But I was like, well, I don't think that pawn matters very much. So I played rook to d8, threatening rook d1 with me. He put me in check, and I moved my king. Now playing white is difficult, because <laughs> rook d1 is me. And I guess the, when I show this game to my son Spencer, he's like, rook g8, the computer move, best. And I was like, yeah. Then if I take it, f7 check, best. <coughs> also true, but OK. Instead, my opponent resigned. So in that game, I castled and he didn't, and I sort of dominated the center. But most importantly, I had a really good pawn structure, and his pawn structure was a bit iffy. In fact, in a lot of openings called the advanced variation, Carol Kahn, French, white gets more space, but white's pawn structure can get a little iffy because he's moving all his pawns up, and then I take them. Okay, and my pawns sort of stay back. And well, the pawn structure changed a bit when I started taking his pieces. Then the pawn structure doesn't matter anymore. OK, the next game was very similar, except black had an even worse pawn structure, or white did. Probably black did, too. OK, so white had a much worse pawn structure in this game. But when he did it, it was intentional, because he had other advantages, but he didn't take advantage of those advantages. OK, great sentence. OK, so I played the Carol Khan. I'm playing Justin Hall, everybody's favorite. 17, uh, 1,600 player. <clears throat> that was supposed to be funny. OK, because I would have been right about two months ago. All right, knight c3. Now, I've played just too many blitz games. And when I play d5 here, he always plays queen f3. And he told me after the game he was not going to play queen f3. He's going to play knight f3. Now, I could prepare for him for hours. OK, but I played e5. I like playing c6, then e5, confusing my opponent. Justin moved instantly, d4. He was not perturbed. Now, I had a game with Nolan Hendrickson a few months ago where he played d3 and then d4. And I took it. He took it with a queen. And even then, white was better. So I was like, man, if I take on d4 now, that's a tempo down. So I played d6. And we traded everything. And this is sort of like a Philidor where white trades queens early, which I've had with white and black. King e8, f6. 
bishop e3, and I decided to try to ruin his pawns with bishop b4, and Justin's like, that's fine. So I did, and now black's development is a bit suspicious, a bit, okay? But I have a good pawn structure. So the game went from really boring when we traded queens to really double-edged. Either he's gonna crush me with his lead in development and two bishops, or he's gonna have the worst pawn structure ever, hopefully the latter, which ended up happening. So I played b6 because I wanted at some point to play king e7 and bishop e6 and trade the bishops. But king e7 runs into bishop c5 check. Also, maybe I'll play bishop a6 and trade bishops. If I can trade, 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 then his pawn structure is pretty bad. But if I don't trade, then he might checkmate me and attack with his bishops. So I want pieces off the board because I have the better pawn structure. Now after b6, white has a very obvious plan which my opponent didn't think of, so I won the game. But every move, white should play this plan. The next 10 moves, white should be doing this. But since he didn't think about it, he didn't do it. That's a good excuse. Can't argue with that. If he thought about it and didn't do it, that's different. Then I would have said, well, you should have done it. You thought about it. Here he's like, oh man, I didn't see that idea. So what's the main idea that white should play in this position? It's very similar to when I played h5, h4 against Preston, except now white's doing it. So what's the winning plan for white? Anyone, Bueller, anyone at home? No, you guys don't know either? What do you think, what do you think Coffer? What do you, what do you got over here? Uh, Justin, told Justin told you, but you remembered. That's impressive. It was a whole day ago. A4, A5. Yeah, you should play a4, a5, okay? And then he's softening me up on the b6 square. He's opening the foul for his rook, and, it's, and he's getting rid of an isolated pawn. Even if white wasn't attacking, white should do that anyway. White has a terrible isolated pawn, and he's trading it off. So after a4, I don't know what I should do. I can't play a5 and stop him because my b6 pawn is hanging. Just takes it. Um, if I don't play a5, then he's going to play a5. So probably I'm going to let him play a5 and I'll play b5 when the moment's right. Then he'll move his bishop and play c4. And his dark square bishop is really good. And we want to talk about that also. When you have two bishops, which white has, white has two bishops, okay? If you're playing bug house, you could have three or four bishops. But in regular chess, you could have two bishops. Black does not have two bishops, which is intentional. I messed up his pawn structure, but I gave him two bishops. Now in this situation, my opponent has a dark squared bishop, and I don't. And we both have white squared bishops. In this instance, he wants his dark squared bishop to crush me, because I can't compete with it. When I play b6, he should be playing a4, a5, accentuating the strength of his dark squared bishop. Now, it's hard to play a4, a5 if you didn't think of it. Then how are you going to play it? Now, there's a game I played with Pavel Blotny from 2002 in the World Open in Philadelphia. And I had a similar pawn structure with white. And I played a4, a5, and eventually I won the game in 1,000 moves. And the game actually went to the New York Times. It was one of the few games I won that they printed. Usually I have to lose, and then it goes right in there. Okay? Even before I lose, like the editors are there. Did he resign? Did he resign? And never mind. Click, and they put it anyway. They just write that I resigned. Okay. But okay, I won this game, and I played a4, a5, traded off my isolated pawn. This pawn is isolated and weak. And there's just nothing black can do. A4, A5, black, white wants to trade it off or make it a strong pawn. And it really makes the bishop on E3 much stronger against my, my crushing pawn chain there. Well, he didn't think of that. He played rook F, E1. And I thought he played rook F, E1 for a very particular reason. But he was like, nah. So I thought that he thought that I wanted to play bishop A6, which is true. And then he can't move his bishop away because his rook is hanging. So I thought he played here, rook f e1. And if I play bishop a6, which I thought about, then he would play bishop to b3, and I, I can't take his rook on f1. But he was like, nah, I just thought my rook was good on e1. You. Instead of uh, that. Instead of that? Uh, could you 
Use your words. Instead of what? Right. He he said he wanted his rook on e1, which I don't I don't know. I don't want my rook on e1. There's like a bishop and a pawn in front of it. So uh, I agree d1 is a better square. Also, I would always play rook f to d1 because I want to play a4, a5. He didn't want to play a4, a5, so he was going to play rook a to d1. So that sort of explains why he played rook f e1. Okay, I played knight e7. And he played knight to d2, which I perfectly understand. If the knight can go to c4 and the knight can go to d6, very reasonable. Okay, now again, I wanted to play king e7 and bishop here and trade the bishops. So I played knight to g6, getting out of the way of my king. My opponent played g3, which stops knight f4 and prepares f4. But this is the wrong plan. a4, a5 is the right plan. And you have to realize, if we both do nothing for the next 10 moves, and as you know, I'm the king of doing nothing, well, then his pawn structure is going to lose the game for him. But if he can checkmate my king in the center and use the fact that his pieces are out and mine aren't, then he could get an advantage that way. And I think a4, a5 is the only way to do this. But he played f4. And I was like, OK, let's get our rook out. And he played f5. Now here, I haven't looked at this game with a computer yet. I suspect the computer is not going to like my move. But I have an affinity for the move knight h8. I play knight h8 a lot. That's why I'm here lecturing, and other grandmasters are playing in grandmaster tournaments, because I like to play knight h8. But OK, so I played knight h8 because I'm going to go to f7 and then to d6. And I was like, OK, knight d6 is a good square. And then my other knight can go to different squares. I don't know. Um, maybe it actually made more sense to play knight f8, knight d7, knight a6, knight c5. Then the knights protect each other. Maybe that made more sense. I don't know. But I, I like knight h8, so I got a chance to play it. So. OK. Most of you probably don't like knight h8. He played rook a d1, and I was very happy, because now I'm not worried about a4, a5 anymore. And if he doesn't play a4, a5, I think he's going to have weak queenside pawns for the next, well, until the game ends. Game didn't go 20 more moves, but if it did, they would have been weak. Bishop a6. Does white want to trade bishops? Anyone? No, white wants to keep all the pieces on the board and attack my stupid king in the center. Okay, But my king's not as stupid as you think. Okay, Two years of community college. OK, I had some rough time, but OK, it's trying. All right, so bishop e6 looks good, OK? It's like Anna Kornikova, looks good, but he's not going to win, OK? And then knight to d7, I finally got my piece developed. And the piece that's not developed is on my favorite square. Yeah. OK, knight h8. Knight d7 was played. Knight f3. After the game, I said, why did you play knight f3? And he said, I thought my knight was good on f3. So that answered my question. Although I don't see why he would think that. Can't go to d4, can't go to e5, can't go to g5. Going to h4 seems odd. And if you remember a few moves ago, I'm not saying you do, but if you remember a few moves ago, his knight was on f3 and he went to d2. So I don't know. I thought the knight was going to d2 as we go to c4 and really crush me. Now, I did actually think of a reason why he played knight f3, but he said, nah, nah, that's not why I did it. I thought if I moved my knight away from at d7, you know, like knight f8, that he would play knight takes e5, I would take, and then bishop g5 check. I thought that was his plan. And I was like, hmm, my king's on e7, my rook's on d8, I gotta watch out for that. Um, so I played knight f7. And now he shocked me. Okay, Peter Gabriel was asked to comment. And he played bishop takes f7 which I was not expecting. I thought he sort of liked his bishop on e6. Okay, but he was pawn grabbing. He wanted to win a pawn, and he won a pawn, so good for him. Um, if he does nothing, I'll play knight d6, and then I'll play knight f8, and this is attacked, and my knight has c4, and he still has these weak pawns. So probably in this position, a computer would say black's better. I'm guessing earlier in the game, it's going to say black was worse because it's going to somehow attack me. One of the things I was worried about for the last several moves 
was bishop c1, bishop a3 check. And he was like, nah, I didn't look at that. So I was worried about a lot of stuff, but it didn't happen. And the stuff I wasn't worried about, trading pieces, that did happen. Now he played rook to d6. And I thought I had many good moves, but the more I looked, the more I didn't like it. My pawn is attacked, and if I play king t7, he can just check me away. If I defend my pawn, he'll double his rooks on the, on the d-file, and my knight is pinned, and it's sort of hard to defend it. It's hard to break the pin. So I played knight f8, now my knight's not pinned. Seriously. And he took a pawn, yay, he's a pawn ahead. And I was thinking, man, I want to win that rook, because the rook has nowhere to go. So the rook can go to c7. So I thought, okay, I'll play rook to d7, and then I'll play bishop b5, and then I'll take his rook. If only things were that easy. But when he stops bishop b5, let's say a4, I don't see how to attack his rook. My king can't attack it. My knight can't attack it. If my bishop attacks his rook, it gives him an escape square. And I could keep attacking it, but I don't think I want to draw. Or if white wants to play for a win, he could go here. So I really wanted to trap his rook, but I couldn't see a good way of doing it. So I just traded the rook off, rook c8. And now white's a pawn ahead, but white's probably losing because all of these pawns are really weak. And I'm going to take all of them, and then some. I'll take some other pawns, too, while I'm at it. Uh, I don't know what to tell you. I would be really unhappy with white here. First of all, there's one way to defend your c3 pawn, and he played it. And now I play rook c4. And I have a very simple plan. I'm going to play bishop b7 and take your pawn. Or I'll play knight d7, knight c5 and take your pawn. Or I'll play rook a4 and a2 and take this pawn. And I don't see what white does. I don't see any plan for white. So by white pushing all of his pawns on the king's side, the e4 pawn is weak. White can't play f3 and protect it. Sort of like what I did. I have a pawn chain. This pawn on e4 can't be protected. So the next two moves were sort of silly. He didn't really do anything. A3, which I don't, I don't get. I attacked his pawn. And now, I thought he was trying to trick me. I thought if I took this pawn, which looks obvious, he would play knight to d4 for total confusion. But when I showed him knight to d4, he was confused. So I guess that wasn't his plan. But yeah, now my bishop is attacked. His knight somehow defends his c and his f pawns. I don't know how that happened. So that was pretty tricky, I thought. But there's nothing he can do to defend his e4 pawn, so I might as well attack it some more. Knight to d7. Knight to c5. Now I'm going to take a lot of pawns. Now he made the strangest move of the game, and there was a prize for that, so he won the prize for strangest move of the game. King to e3. Letting me take on e4 with check and winning the g pawn. Very suspicious. Probably better was something like h3, so his g pawn's defended. Then I would take all his other pawns. But. And I thought his idea after rook g4 was to play rook takes e5. I'm sure you were all thinking of that, right? And if I take on e5, which I would not have, he takes and forks my, my king and rook. Right, Alex? See, exactly. Uh, and then probably still a draw. <coughs> Okay, but I have a Zwischenzug in between move intermezzo where I don't take his rook. By the way, if I take his knight, and you'll notice now his knight can't fork me because it's not on the board anymore. That makes it hard. Plus it's bug house. Then my rook is hanging. I hate when that happens. And probably also a draw. Okay, so what I was going to do was throw in a check. This check is hard to meet. Because wherever you move your king, I'm going to play knight takes bishop. Let's move the king here. We'll move it somewhere. So black's a piece ahead, because I just took a piece. This piece is attacked twice. This piece is attacked. The obvious moves for white are to take my knight. Okay, As Henny Youngman would say, take my knight, please. He would have said, please, right? You heard of Henny Youngman, unlike everybody else. Well, you probably heard of him, too. 
but okay, everybody else is like, what? All right, now, <clears throat> if king takes knight, bishop takes knight, I think black can win because I have an extra bishop, plus a better pawn structure. And if he takes with a knight, he can't play, he can't play knight takes and fork because his knight's not there. So I would take his rook and I'm up a rook. And Justin saw that and decided that would be good for me because I'm up a rook. So instead of playing rook takes pawn, which fails to knight e4 check, he did not play rook takes pawn. And he played h3. Okay, and I have many good rook moves, but he would suspect that. So I didn't move my rook, I played knight e4 check. And this is stronger than moving my rook because now my rook has access to g3. And when I go rook g3, it's going to be really bad for him. So for example, if king to e3, saving his king, I play rook to g3. Now we have some serious pinning and attacking action going on here. That's going to be really bad for white. If somehow white defends that, which is impossible, then I'll still win this pawn on h3. And then I'll be two pawns ahead. Although if you defend that knight on f3, you're a better player than I am. Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take, take a lot of things in the next few moves. And as you can see, as I promised last game, although I did promise Aroni would be Carlson in the Blitz game when he was like plus five and he didn't win. But I promised last game there would be five isolated pawns this game. I promised. So, so white's pawn structure is not very good. And after 94 check, uh, white resigned because I'm probably going to be three or four pawns up in the next four moves. And that was too many pawns for him. So in both games, my opponents had bad pawn structures. But in this game, my king was getting in a little trouble. That's what we call double-edged play. The first game wasn't double-edged. I just had good pawn structure. He had bad pawn structure. So it was just fun for me. This game was less fun because I had a good pawn structure. He had a bad pawn structure. But my king was exposed. And he had a lead in development. So he could have tried to punish me better. But instead, he moved all of his king side pawns forward and didn't really attack my king. So those were played on the same day, and I got my full rating point. One rating point for two wins. Yes. Okay. The most I could have hoped for. Okay. You can't get more than that for winning two games. Right, Julian? Who drew a game and gained 800 points. Oh.